Several announcements before we enter into a time of worship. The first is that um, this is a wonderful day in which we can not only gather in God's house for worship, but we do have the opportunity to have baptism this morning. So um, rejoice in God's faithfulness and His great covenant love this morning. Second, um, great news also, Thelma surgery went well and is able to be with us today in, in worship, and so, so good to hear that. Also, um, Wanted to make you aware that after the service, there will be coffee and donuts. And so as you're walking outside, um, help yourself to those. Did have um, received news that Ken Arenzi's dad did pass away this week. Um, he was able to be with his father um, at that time. Um, but the funeral is this week. Pray for Joni as she'll be traveling down to be with Ken and the rest of the family, and just pray that God would use this um, in that family, um, just that there would be gospel opportunities that accompany um, the, the funeral service. Let's stand for our call to worship. The psalmist declares, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, 
who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, our desire is to echo the sentiment of the psalmist this day that all that is within us would bless Your holy name. Father, we praise You this day for Your steadfast love and faithfulness. We thank You that You are a God of mercy and of grace who forgives us our sins and draws us into a relationship with Yourself through the work, the perfect work of Your Son. And so it is on this day that we come into Your presence not because of our own merits, but we come because we are found in Jesus Christ, trusting in what He has accomplished on behalf of us. Father, help us to truly worship You, to offer up praise to Your great and glorious name that You're worthy of. Guide us by Your Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive God's greeting. Grace, mercy, and love be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you take your Trinity Psalter, we'll sing what we just read from 103C. Come, my soul, and bless the Lord. And we'll be singing verses 1, 3, 4, 7, and 8. 1, 3, 4, 7, and 8 of 103 C.
Heavenly Father, how can we not bless your great and holy name for all that you are and all that you have done? For a salvation that is rich and full and free, a salvation that's secure because it's the work of you, the work of our great triune God on behalf of your people. Father, may this truly be a day in which we rejoice in such a great and full salvation. Help us to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're seated, if you take out your bulletin and turn to the form for baptism, I did want to just make one quick comment about Psalm 103. It's just, we just sang it, we just read a part, part of it, but it's really a psalm in the Old Testament that is so clear about the gospel, about the work of Jesus Christ on behalf of his people. There comes a point in the text, we sang a part of it in, in, from this rendering of, of Psalm 103, where it talks about that if you're faithful in keeping covenant, if you, if you keep his commandment, that this benefit will go from your children to your children. But the good news of the Gospel is that the reason why that's in there, that that sure promise is in the midst of this incredible declaration of Psalm 103, that God's unfailing love is with His people forever, and that you can be sure of that is that the reason why those blessings are ours is because Jesus Christ kept the covenant in our place. It's not dependent on on me keeping the covenant. It's not dependent on me keeping... God's commandments. It's dependent upon the great covenant keeper, Jesus Christ. And He did it. And because I'm found in Him, what it means is I'm forever secure. I know that His unfailing love will be upon me and cannot change. Because I didn't earn it. And I surely don't need to continue to merit it. Because Jesus Christ did. And I'm found in Him. And I hope that that wasn't something we just sang. My prayer is that that's a reality for each of us. That we understand the fullness of the salvation we have in and through Jesus Christ which in so many ways brings us to the form for baptism. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we are here to celebrate holy baptism, let us first hear our Lord Jesus Christ's institution of this sacrament. After He had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to His disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In obedience to this command, the church has always baptized believers and their children. Let us hear the promises of God which are confirmed in baptism. The Lord made this great promise to Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Generations later, though Israel was unfaithful to God's covenant with them, God renewed His promise through the prophet. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to give pardon and peace through the blood of the cross, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. After Jesus had risen from the dead, the apostles proclaimed, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. Anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises, Paul assures us, If we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, 
for he cannot deny himself. These are the unfailing promises of our Lord. Hear also the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our sin by the blood of Christ and the renewal of our lives by the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. From this, we learn that our sin has been condemned by God, that we are to hate it and consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, the water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. From this, we learn that we are to walk with Christ in newness of life. All this tells us that God has adopted us as His children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Thus, in baptism, God seals the promises He gave when He made His covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust for life and death in Christ our Savior, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Him in obedience and love. God also graciously includes our children in His covenant, and all His promises are for them as well as us. Jesus demonstrated this when He embraced little children and blessed them. The Apostle Paul said that children of believers are holy. So just as the children of the Old Covenant received the sign of circumcision, our children in the New Covenant are given the sign of baptism. We are therefore always to teach our little ones that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children. And because of that, they are to repent of their sins and embrace God's promise of forgiveness in Christ by faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the visible signs and seal of baptism. We thank You that of what it declares about the work of Jesus Christ on behalf of Your people. That for those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, there is a forgiveness that is sure. Father, we pray that this would be a reality for each of us gathered. That all of us would be those that trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. Thank You for condescending and showing us this with the use of water. Help us not to trust in the sacrament. Help us instead to Trust in the One to which this points to. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So since Matt and Carly have presented their children for holy baptism, you are asked to answer the following questions sincerely before God and His people. So Matt and Carly, if you would stand. First, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Accept the promises of God made to you in your baptism and affirm the truth of the Christian faith that is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this Christian church. Second, do you believe that your ch children, though sinful by nature, are received by God as members of His covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And third, do you promise, in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community, to do all in your power to instruct your children in the Christian faith and lead them by your example into the life of Christian discipleship. If the congregation would please stand. Do you, the congregation, the people of the Lord, promise to receive these children in love, to pray for them and to help them in the instruction in their faith? and to encourage and sustain them in the fellowship of believers. We do. Congregation can be seated. Matt and Carly and family, if you want to come up to the baptismal font. Just want to double check. I do have Aberlina right here, right? Yeah. So I'm going to have you come on this side. Aberlina, I baptize you into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Everlene, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are humbled by your great faithfulness, for your covenant promises. Father, we don't trust in this water, but we do trust in you. We do depend upon you. And we do look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Father, I'd ask that you would do a work in the hearts of Aberlina and Aberlene. That's what symbolized here becomes a reality in their lives. That they would come to repent and believe and trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. That they would recognize their need for the blood of Jesus Christ to wash them and cleanse them. Father, we know that this is a sovereign work of Your Spirit. And we also know that You desire to work within Your covenant lines and Your covenant community. And we thank You that You have brought these two into this church family. May we love them and come alongside of them and walk with them. May you be with Matt and Carly as they raise these girls and their other children that they might know you and love you and follow you all of their days. Father, we thank you for the gospel preached. We thank you for the gospel displayed. Glorify your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing from the Trinity Psalter, number 236, To God Be the Glory, and we'll stand to sing.
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning humbled by your majesty and awestruck at your goodness to us. We can see your provision each day, especially with the changing of the seasons and the rain which replenishes the earth. For you are not a God that created us and left us on our own, but you rule and reign over all creation. <coughs> it is because of this that we can confidently say that every good and perfect gift comes from your sovereign hand. Your love is amazing and your mercies are new every morning. We thank you, God, that just as the psalmist says, you do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For we confess that we are a people prone to wander. We too often rely on our own wisdom and strength. We take too much comfort in our own security of material possessions. Lord, let us be a people that look to you first. Let us rest in our unity with Christ and look to the creator, not the created, as our true source of comfort and surety. Let us also be quick to repent of our sins and quick to ask and grant forgiveness to our neighbors. We pray this morning over our congregation for those that are sick or suffering. We thank you for the news of Thelma's surgery. We pray for quick healing and that the surgery would successfully address the pain that she has been dealing with for so long. We think of Herm Roost and his back pain as well. Continue to strengthen him and give him relief. Uh, we pray for peace and comfort for the Aaronsy family as they mourn the loss of Ken's dad, Art. We pray, Lord, that you would just be a comfort for them through this time. We also think of Paula and Eddie and the life-threatening illnesses they face. Lord, we do not know where they stand in terms of their faith. Grant them healing if it is your will and draw them unto yourself. Lord, we also ask that you be with our college students as they're away, especially in the time of the unknown. Grant them what they stand in need of. Grant them the focus they need to continue in their studies. Lord, we also have many unspoken requests of hurts that have been done to us, hurts that we have caused, physical ailments, loneliness, persecution. Lord, you know our hearts and our anxious thoughts, and we lift these things to you. Grant us your comfort and peace, and let us, as your body, be a comfort to one another, that we may be strengthened in our faith. We thank you, Lord, that we can participate in the baptism this morning of Aberlene and Aberlina. What a joy it is to see the physical signs of your covenant with us. May we as a congregation do all we can to live up to the promise that we made, not only to these girls, but to all our covenant children. We pray too for those that have wandered from the faith, that they may be drawn to you and remember the teachings of their youth, that in you and you alone is the way to salvation and true joy. We also ask a special blessing over our Sunday school programs, that your word would be hidden in their hearts and that it would be edifying to all those involved. We also pray for our missionaries, both here and abroad, Grant them protection from those that would wish them harm and from spiritual forces of evil. Go before them, Lord, and pave the way that they may plant the seeds of the gospel so that your name would be praised throughout all nations. Let us also be bold in our proclamation of that gospel. Let us all be a light in this dark world. We thank you, God, on this Pastor Appreciation Sunday for Russ and his family. We thank you for his giftedness, his passion, and dedication for your kingdom and for this body. We pray for protection over him and his family, that they may stand firm. We also pray, Lord, that we as a congregation can be uplifting and encouraging to them when times get difficult. Thank you, God, for the gift of worship. We thank you for a country in which we can freely worship your name. That is not the case throughout the world, and we pray for strength for those who cannot. We pray now for the preached word, to be powerful and mighty in, in its efficacy, and that it would not return void. We pray that in all we do, your name be glorified above all else. This we pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you take out your bulletin, we'll be singing a new song this morning, um, Show Us Christ. In a moment, we'll stand, but Kim is going to play through it for us so that we hopefully... We'll do well when we sing it in a moment. So show us Christ.
you're seated, if you'll take out your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 16. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 15 of Acts 16. Acts 16, starting in verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, were, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, if you remember from last week, Paul and his companions are here as a result of a vision that Paul had received of a man from Macedonia calling out, come over and help. So in some ways, our text is not a surprise, but in other ways, our text is a little bit of a surprise. We expect Paul to be making his way to Macedonia. We would also probably expect that he's going to encounter the man from the vision. Not a woman from Thyatira. This is God directing the gospel into Europe. And the first convert is from Asia. And is a woman, not a man. See, God moves in mysterious ways in order to accomplish His purposes. And this morning it concerns Lydia coming to faith in Jesus Christ in the town of Philippi. And we want to look at that story using two points. The first is conversion, and the second is fruit. Conversion and then fruit. First, conversion. We start this morning with really a a ton of background information. Now, if you remember from last week, we were introduced to the the we passages in Luke. What we have from last week was that they have this vision of this man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then in verse 10, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought. Up until this point, we haven't had the first person plural pronoun. But now we have it. And that's because at this point, it seems as if Luke has joined the missionaries. And Luke is including himself in the narrative. And one of the interesting tidbits about the fact that when Luke is including himself in the narrative, what we have is we get a little bit of insight on what Luke actually thought was kind of important. Luke loves the details about the trip. And so in the we passages of of the book of Acts, what you'll find is there's always greater detail about where they're traveling, how long it took, and oftentimes what the weather was like. He could have worked for my small town newspaper when I was growing up. And so you get a ton of details about their trip. He tells us in verse 11 that they went from Troas to Samothrace and then to Neapolis, roughly 150 miles. They make it in two days, which means that they had favorable winds. Later on in the book of Acts, he's also going to describe this journey on the return trip in chapter 20, and it took them five days to make the same trip. Then in verse 12, he tells us that from Neapolis they go to Philippi, which was 10 miles further inland. 
If you know your history, you know that Philippi was named for Philip of Macedonia, the great Greek conqueror, and eventually will go from Greece to Rome, and eventually will become a Roman colony. Now, it's not the capital city of Macedonia, but it is on the main road that travels east and west through Macedonia, so it's a a fairly significant commercial center. But it's important, not necessarily for today's text, but especially for tomorrow's, or next, not tomorrow, we're not meeting tomorrow, for next time's text, I mean, I'm all in if you want to come back. But it's important for where Luke is going with the story, that it's a Roman colony. Because as a Roman colony, what that meant was that in essence, everything that was true about Rome was also true for Philippi. All of the same legal status and requirements. They had Roman law. They were autonomous in their government. They were people that did not have to pay taxation. They had no tribute. Philippi was more than likely settled by those that were the surplus population of other areas that got relocated to Philippi. Also a location of many of the military that were retired and they were given parcels of land. And so when you go to Philippi, you're going to a true Roman city. 80% of the inscriptions of Philippi would be Latin, which tells us that this is an Italian city. But it also would help us describe or understand why Paul is not able to do his common and normal practice. Typically, he would come to a city and he would go to the synagogue. He doesn't go to a synagogue. And it's probably because there wasn't one that was there. For them to have a synagogue in a city, they needed at least ten Jewish men. It doesn't appear that there were 10 Jewish men in Philippi. And so instead, they go to the riverside. Our text tells us that they supposed there was a place of prayer. They were looking for this gathering. It appears that the gathering, which would have been outside of the city by the riverside, was functioning as a synagogue. And when they find this group of women, they sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered. Then in verse 14, we're introduced to Lydia, a Gentile woman from Thyatira. Thyatira was known for its dyes. Lydia herself was a wealthy businesswoman who made her living in purple dyes, which is the the cloth of the wealthy. Um, Thyatira, we will know from later on, from the book of Revelation, that a church will be founded there. One of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, one of them is written to the church of Thyatira. Whether this is the inaugural member of that church, we're not told those details. But it could be that this was the birth of that church that later Jesus will write a letter to through the Apostle John. Now we're told that Lydia is a worshiper of God. A God-fearer. But she's not a Christian. She knows of the God of Israel. But she doesn't know Jesus Christ. The one way of salvation. This is an incredible reminder for us, isn't it? That religion is not enough. The form of religion is not enough. We 
We baptized two young girls this morning. We don't believe that that saved those two young girls. We believe it brings them into the covenant family. We believe that it points them to the source of salvation, which is Jesus Christ alone. But as I said last week, Sunday night, we, we can't trust in the externals. It's not enough to be a God-fearer. It's not enough to have religion. We need what Lydia would later receive, which is a new heart, which is Jesus Christ. We come to a key aspect of the text, Lydia's conversion in the second half of verse 14. Lydia had heard the message of Paul. Verse 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia. We're not told the content, but with Paul we don't have to guess, do we? What Paul was about was preaching and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what text he used. We don't know how he got there. But we know he proclaimed the gospel. But there's this key phrase. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. To pay attention, to follow, to adhere to, to truly hear. The Lord did that work. Every week I I preach behind this pulpit. And the reality is, some hear and some don't. No, no, I, I don't mean that some of you sleep, some of you do. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is some truly hear. And some of the words just bounce around in your ear and then they're they're gone. And what we have here is Paul bringing a gospel message and the Lord opens up the heart of Lydia so she can hear, really hear. Luke is highlighting God's sovereignty and salvation. This is not the first time that Luke has talked about this. In Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's meeting with his disciples in the upper room, and he comes to them and he opens up the word of the Lord and he talks to them about how the law and the prophet and the Psalms are all about him. And the text tells us that he, Jesus Christ, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I'm not convinced that Jesus told them anything different in this encounter than He had told them in the previous three years. But in the previous three years, they were just words to the disciples. They didn't have a mind and a heart to to understand. But here in the upper room, Jesus, as it is, as it were, reaches down and opens up their heart and their mind and says, No, I want you to see. I want you to truly hear. I want you to understand who I am and what I've done and what I've accomplished. God opened up their hearts and their minds. And that's what happens to Lydia in our text. But we shouldn't be surprised by this. We've already seen this multiple times in our journey through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, in verse 26, 
God, having raised up His servant, sent Him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. It's the Lord that turned them. Acts chapter 11, verse 18, they glorify God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. They didn't conjure up repentance from within them. God graciously gives them repentance. Acts 13, 48, they began rejoicing and glorifying the Word of the Lord and and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. No, this is the sovereign work of God in salvation. John Stott would write, the message is Paul's. The saving initiative, that belongs to God. See, Paul's preaching is not effective in and of itself. It's only effective because it is joined with the work of God. I mentioned this before from this pulpit, but this is why Charles Spurgeon, every time he climbed the steps going up to the pulpit, he would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Because Spurgeon was acknowledging that if he went to the pulpit in his own strength, that his words were nothing. The preached Word only has power when it's accompanied by the work of the Spirit. And what Spurgeon was declaring is, I believe that God can take these these words and apply them and penetrate hearts and lives. I believe in the Spirit. God's sovereignty in salvation is the pattern of all of Scripture. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 and 6, we read, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, by nature, we all have dark hearts. And the preached Word comes and shines and breaks through the darkness. 1 Thessalonians 1 says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our Gospel came to you not only in Word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Salvation, a sovereign work of God. Now I want to pause just a moment. Because I think this is so important to understand and to know for several reasons. First, God does use means. We need to be faithful in our proclamation of the good news of the Gospel. But second, we can rest in the reality that salvation belongs to the Lord. We don't have to have an unhealthy concern about the results. The conversion of of people is not based upon The quality of our presentation, it's not based upon how persuasive we are. It doesn't, it depends upon our efforts, our technique, and and somehow where we say, oh, they would have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if I would have just said this, or if I had done that, or if I'd been more faithful in this area.
No, we rest in the reality that salvation belongs to the Lord. And the great news is God uses fallible, fumbling, mumbling, bumbling people to accomplish His good pleasure in bringing about the salvation of His people. He doesn't need your eloquence. He doesn't need your knowledge. He doesn't need your impeccable resume with with, with regard to your ability to proclaim the good news of the Gospel. We little ones know the heart of the Gospel. That we are sinners. Unable to save ourselves. But God. But God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. I think we can get that message right. But third, knowing that God is sovereign in salvation is a reason for hope. There is no power that can resist the work of God. We never have to despair about those that are outside of Christ. Our text this morning is really just a plane out of the picture of Ezekiel 37. So if you keep your finger in Acts chapter 16 and turn back to Ezekiel 37. We'll start in verse 1. Of Ezekiel 37, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and He led me around among them. And behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, You know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and come over you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone, And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. This is the heart of preaching. This is the heart of gospel proclamation. That we encounter people that are like a valley of dry bones. There's no life in them. But then God comes in His power, doesn't He? And the question is, uh, life can't come to these dry bones. It can't. And throughout Ezekiel 37, God keeps saying, Behold, behold, behold. In Hebrew, that is, pay attention right here, right now, I'm coming. 
Right now I'm coming in a power that cannot be resisted. Where you see death, where you see hardness, where you see no life, I am the God of life, and I'm going to come with all of my power and breathe life in that which cannot be alive. Prophesy. Preach. Proclaim. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. Oh, house of Israel, don't think it's because of you. Isn't that what we declare every time we step to this? We're not saying something about us. What we're doing is we're saying something about God. And what we're saying is, oh, house of Israel, don't think it's because of this. Don't think it's because of you that I'm going to act. I'm going to act because of my great name. For the, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations in which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and it will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And that's what happened with Lydia. God says, I want to glorify my holy name. And I'm going to find a woman from Thyatira and say, she's mine. And I'm going to put a new spirit within her and draw her unto myself. And what's going to be the result? She's going to be changed. She is going to be one that will walk in God's statutes and be careful to obey His rules. That's just shorthand for saying that there will be fruit in her life. Which is our second point, fruit. In verse 15 of our text, we see the fruit of her conversion her baptism and her hospitality. First, her baptism. We're told in verse 15 that Lydia and her household were baptized. And with baptism, Lydia is declaring the Gospel. The work of God in her heart and life that she was God's because of the work of Jesus Christ on her behalf. But what do we, what do, we do with the fact that her household's baptized? This is actually one of four household baptisms in the book of Acts. We've already seen one earlier in the book. We'll see one later in this chapter and then another one still later in the book. We actually find one in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul will make reference to a household baptism there as well. So what do we decide? What do we do with this? Does this prove infant baptism? No. Now, I, I do think it would be remarkable if we would talk about these five household baptisms and conclude that there were no children involved in any of them. But you know what the reality is? What are we told about the households? The 
nothing. We're not, we're not told anything. So everybody that comes to the text on the household baptisms have to make their own inferences. We have to put something in the text because the text doesn't give us all the details. We're not told a number. We're not told an age. We're not told whether they believed or didn't believe. I'm going to say something that I'm sure is what I'm not supposed to say as somebody that believes in infant baptism. I don't think it matters at all whether there were children in the households or not. Or infants. I, I, I don't think it matters. Because I don't think that's the point. The point is that God is communicating something. What He's communicating is a familial solidarity. A covenantal aspect. Which reflects what He communicated throughout the entire Old Testament. With the institution of circumcision in Genesis 17, it was for Abraham and all of his family, all that belonged to him, not only his children, but all of his servants. And we know in that case that that included the very young. And here we have Another demonstration of a corporate mindset. Sinclair Ferguson writes this, The occurrence of household baptisms in the New Testament is best understood as an expression of the Old Testament covenantal principle of the solidarity of the family. The baptism of an entire household echoes the pattern governing circumcision. The New Testament term Okois, meaning household, translates the Hebrew war, word ve'et. Throughout the entire Old Testament, it sing, signifies the entire family, even the extended family, and automatically included all members, whatever their ages. In particular, the Hebrew term expresses the corporate concept of family in the biblical world. In distinction from the independent concept, an individualistic characteristic of our post-enlightenment world. Some of this is so hard for us because we live in a world that is absolutely framed by individualism. We can't hardly not think as individuals. That concept was completely foreign to a Hebrew mindset. They only thought in terms of corporate. And so for them, when one, the head of the household, came to faith, it naturally meant that they all came into that same covenant relationship. And I'm actually going to develop this more fully tonight. We're actually at the point in the Belgic Confession where we're dealing with baptism. Um, I didn't orchestrate the baptism today, nor the text this morning and the text tonight. They just did all just come on this same day. So I'm not going to preach my sermon tonight, this morning. But I don't think it's a throwaway line in our text that her household was baptized with her. I think it has great significance. I think it shows something about the covenant heart of God. And if you have questions about this, I would invite you to come back tonight as we work through the Belgic and work through Colossians 2. I'll develop this more fully tonight. Um, and if you have questions about this, if this has been something that has troubled you and you haven't been able to work it out in your, your own mind, what I would suggest is at least come in here. At least wrestle with it. Um, 
Now, we still, at the end of the day, might disagree with one another. But I think it's worth exploring. Now, I think at least two things can be said right here. First, Lydia is declaring externally what God has done internally. Baptism is a, a public declaration about the person and work of Jesus Christ. I, hopefully, that's something that all of us can believe, or hold to no matter where we are with regard to what we believe with regard to covenantal or credo baptism. That baptism always is about the work and person of Jesus Christ. It's never about us. The sacraments are not our declaration. They're God's declaration. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's about the Gospel. It's about Jesus Christ, His person, His work. When we come to baptism, whether you believe in credo or, or covenantal, we've got to believe that it's about the person and work of Jesus Christ alone. What are we going to declare about ourselves? That we're sinners? That we're worthless? That we have no merit before God? No. Oh. What we're declaring is that God is the God of Psalm 103. That He's rich in mercy. That He's unfailing in His love. That He is a God that forgives all of our transgressions. That He is the God that is merciful and gracious and loving and kind. That we don't deserve. But second, I think what we can say is that our household is now in a covenantal relationship with God which is what I'm going to develop full, more fully tonight. The second fruit we see in our text is Lydia's hospitality. I think sometimes people see Lydia as kind of a sidebar in chapter 16. That The, the real message of, of chapter 16 is Paul and Silas in jail, the Philippian jailer. Um, but that's not actually how Luke writes the text, is it? Lydia is the key person of, of Philippi. How can I say that? Because Luke frames the section on Philippi with Lydia. Lydia is the point. Her conversion is followed by what's at the end of the chapter. They're released from prison and they visited Lydia. And it's Lydia's hospitality that is front and center. Lydia is quite forceful about that. She urged them. She prevailed upon them. She's insistent that they come to her home. Dennis Johnson writes that when we hear God's gracious welcome home, we respond by opening our homes to others. She's opening her heart to those that belong to Jesus Christ. She wants to support them and love for them and care for them and be in their lives and have them be in her life. This is such a unique um, aspect of modern day Christian faith that we really downplay hospitality and disregard the clear commands. They're not suggestions. They're the clear commands of God with regard to how we're supposed to interact with one another, with regard to having people in our homes and being in other people's homes. We kind of look at it as, as a side option. Nice if I want to. Eh, don't really have to. Um. I don't think God's commands work that way. These are imperatives. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Romans 12, 13. 1 Peter 4, 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. You can't just wave them away. It doesn't work. See, the principle is we have been brought into God's family by grace. A grace that's amazing. A grace that we didn't earn. And because of that, we now have access to an entire family. 
And the idea is that as we've received God's love, that we can't help but love God's people. We can't love people at a distance. You have to love people that are by you and you're in their life and, and, and you're in theirs. came across a, a little piece by Richard Phillips where he was talking about the difference between showing hospitality and entertaining. And I found it helpful. He writes this. I want to impress you with my beautiful home, my clever decorating, my gourmet cooking. That's entertaining. But hospitality, however, seeks to minister. It says, this home is not mine. It's truly a gift from my master. I'm his servant and I use it as he desires. Hospitality does not try to impress, but to serve. Entertaining always puts things before people. As soon as I get the house finished, the living room decorated, my place settings complete, my housework done, then I'll start having people in. The so-and-sos are coming. I must buy that such-and-such before they come. Hospitality, however, puts people before things. We have no furniture. We'll eat on the floor. Entertaining subtly declares, this is mine, these rooms, these adornments. This is an expression of my personality. It's an extension of who and what I am. Look, please, and admire. Hospitality whispers, what is mine is yours. Here is the secret of community that is all but lost to the church today. The hospitality of the first century church clearly says, what's mine is yours. Now, I can try to shame you into practicing hospitality. But what I'd rather say is, I wish you knew what you were giving away by not practicing it. What you would find is that when you really embrace what hospitality, biblical hospitality is, what you'll see is your life is enriched. Your joy is expanded. Because what you realize is that as you seek to bring other people into your life to encouraging them, you'll find that you're in their life and they're encouraging you. There's people gathered here this morning that some of you will say, I, I've seen them, I don't know who they are. I've got a little secret. You can invite them in your home and guess what? You'll get to know them. You'll hear their story. You'll double your love. No, you don't have to do it. Well, you kind of do because God commands it. But you don't have to do it for me. I think you do it because it pleases your, your, your master. Well, just a couple questions for you before we leave. One, have you, have you experienced the transformative power of God in your heart and life? Have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? And second, does it show? Is there fruit? Well, in both cases, if you've not come to saving faith, I would declare to you that Jesus Christ is a willing Savior. And if your life has been lacking fruit, I would say that the Spirit 
is a wonderful sanctifier. By His power, you come to faith. By His power, your faith produces fruit. And the result is God gets glory. And that's the key. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we would pray that You would give us new loves and affections for those that are outside of Christ, that they would have their hearts stirred, their minds opened to see the loveliness of Jesus Christ, that they would put their faith in Him alone, that they would have a new affection in Jesus Christ. Father, for Your people gathered here today, we also pray that You would also give new affections, that they would love Your people, that they would have a desire to truly know one another and allow one another into their lives. Most of all, we pray that your great name would receive glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, if you take your Trinity Psalter, we'll stand to sing number 427. I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew. Number 427. After the benediction, we'll sing as the doxology, the first and seventh verse of O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Those are printed in the bulletin. And as you're leaving, your offerings will be received at the door. The first for Christian Education Assistance Fund and the second for the General Fund. Receive God's blessing as we leave. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father 
and the fellowship and communion of the Spirit be with us all. Amen.